it's live i think on the youtube i'm starting sir good evening everyone on behalf of isa national it's my pleasure to welcome you all to yet another isa online pg class today's session is again very very important anesthetic management of mitral stenosis in pregnancy we have two wonderful speakers and to moderate the session we have two renowned teachers across the board but before we begin the session as a customary it's important to take the blessings of ma saraswati May I now invite Professor Bajwa Sir, Honorary Secretary, ISA National, to address the gathering and discuss the relevance of this topic. Over to you, Sir. Thank you, Uncle. Uh, today a very auspicious day, the birth anniversaries of two great stalwarts of India, Bapu Ji and Shastri Sir. Hey na, the people who have really defined the things. they find the modern india i think they laid the platform for this modern day india and i am really thankful to dr nand kishore agarwal sir because even on the holiday today is a guested holiday he agreed to participate in the class and uh, that's really nice of him and the students and uh, dr mamta sinha is the coordinator with him so it is really nice the topic is very relevant because mitral stenosis in pregnancy we do encounter many cases and this question come uh, it comes as a long question also in the examination and uh, invariably the, our system is like that whenever we encounter anesthesia we are encountering more of the obstetric patients almost every day we are doing obstetrics provided you are working in a super specialty hospital where obstetric is not a part of your daily anesthetic regime otherwise you are encountering obstetric patients and if you encounter a mitral stenosis and with the rheumatic heart disease and other part another uh, cardiac disease it become a very difficult scenario for you although many things have already been discussed about the pregnancy and other things but mitral stenosis exclusively it has to be discussed in length so that we can clear all our doubts and we are really very happy and uh, that dr nand kishore dr mamta they are there with along with their students so uh, without wasting time i like ankur to start the class thank you so much sir for your enlightening words and introducing the topic to everyone may i now invite dr arpita das she will be the coordinator for today's program Dr Arpita Das is an assistant professor in the department of anesthesiology in Atal Bihari Vajpayee Government Medical College Vidisha May I now request Dr Arpita Das to kindly introduce our moderators of today's program Hello Over everyone to you, Arpita. Hello everyone ladies and gentlemen esteemed guests and participants It gives me great pleasure to introduce our distinguished moderator, Dr. Nand Kishore Agarwal sir, who currently serves as professor and head of Department of Anesthesiology at AIMS Raipur. With an illustrious career spanning over 33 years, sir is a renowned expert and is also a recognized PG teacher. Dr. Agarwal is affiliated with many esteemed organizations such as IMA, ISA, Indian Diabetic Association. and holds significant roles as a member of board of studies chairman of department of ethical committee and is a valued member of academy of medical council in realm of innovation dr agarwal sir is a trail blazer he holds copyright of anesthesia risk criteria pediatric circuit addc that is alveolar diffusion damage calculator which is a software additionally 
His contribution to respiratory science is highlighted by formulation of a new respiratory equation. Sir holds patents, including the pa pending patent for bougie assisted video laryngoscopy. His contributions extend far beyond classroom. He has presented, presented insightful papers at national and international conferences. He has published a book on public awareness and is the winner of MN Patel Gold Medal. Beyond his professional pursuits, Dr. Nankishore Sir has represented the district in badminton and has won IMN Actors singles in 2011. Our next distinguished moderator who will be joining us today is Dr. Mamta Sinhamam, who is an esteemed professional in the field of anesthesiology. She is currently serving as Associate Professor in Department of Anesthesiology at Ames Driver. Her remarkable achievements include earning a gold medal in MD anesthesiology, demonstrating her exceptional dedication and expertise in the field. She is also a distinguished NTSC scholar showcasing her academic excellence from a young age. As a dedicated educator, she mentors post-diploma critical care courses in onco-anesthesia. She has multiple publications in index journals and has been invited as faculty to various national and international uh, national conferences and workshops. Dr. Sinha's areas of interest include onco-anesthesia, regional anesthesia, and obstetric anesthesia, reflecting her diverse skill set and passion for advancing medical knowledge. Now, I would like to, uh, like to invite the moderators to kindly introduce today's speakers uh, for the evening. And am I audible, sir? Yes, sir, yeah. you are audible, sir. Good evening, area. Thank you, Dr. Bajwa, Dr. Apita, and Dr. Khandelwal. Today, we'll be discussing material expenses management in pregnancy. As we all know, 40% of the, our patients belong to obstetric patients. And uh, as the scenario is, Move on, there is a marked decrease in the cases of mitral stenosis. It has decreased from 5%, 5 per thousand to 1 per thousand. But still, as the population is increasing, the number of patients we are getting are very high. And in India, the issue is that many times obstetrician call us during the labor that the patient is sinking, our patient is in pulmonary edema. And when we go and first time see that the patient is having mitral stenosis, that time to manage the things is very difficult. So today we'll try to discuss all the aspects, how the physiology of pregnancy affect the mitral stenosis and how the mitral stenosis affect the pregnancy in detail. Our two presenter will are Dr. Chani K, she is JR3 and Dr. Sandeep is also JR3. And the questions we'll try to answer at the end of the session. Thank you. Sir, may I now request the speakers to begin your session? Yes, sir. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I am Dr. Chandni Jayatri from uh, Ames Raipur, and uh, today I'll be presenting uh, on the topic mitral stenosis in pregnancy. So the, the discussion will be under the following headings, introduction, cardiovascular changes in pregnancy, cardiac examination, and etiology of mitral stenosis followed by pathophysiology, evaluation, and its uh, management in pregnant patients followed by a short summary. So why to know about this topic? Like by the end of this class, these are our learning objectives. We should be able to answer these questions like who, what, when, where, and how. Who is that? Like we have to assess the patients right from before the uh, patients are planning for pregnancy. And this includes risk stratification and assessment. And by the time a patient comes for delivery, we have to uh, decide on the mode of delivery, like vaginal or if the patient requires a cesarean delivery. And depending upon the morbidity and the severity of complications, we have to decide if the pregnancy can be con continued up to turn or if early termination of pregnancy is required. And in high risk patients, the uh, medical care should be always provided in a uh, multi specialty hospital where all the resources are available. 
and uh, and uh, after that we have to decide on the anesthetic uh, plan and also how to manage the patient post operatively so uh, moving on to the introduction of uh, uh, this class we have or it has been uh, known that worldwide the prevalence of antenatal heart disease is estimated at 1% but and uh, the prevalence and the causes of diseases is different in both developed and developing countries in developed countries congenital heart diseases are the most common cardiac conditions complicating pregnancy as shown in this pie chart we can see that congenital conditions are the causes of almost 24% of cardiac diseases in pregnancy followed by peripartum cardiomyopathy and other causes of cardiomyopathy at 23% and valvular lesions contributing for 16% of pregnancy whereas in developing countries the most common uh, heart disease in pregnancy is rheumatic heart disease and uh, the incident and the highest prevalence has been reported in india china pakistan and uh, indonesia and uh, De democratic republic of congo almost accounting for 73% of global cases up to 4% of pregnancies have cardiovascular complications without any prior history of uh, cardiac illness and uh, it is all it is known that like what whatever severity of maternal cardiac disease is present it can be associated with an increased risk of neonatal complications hence optimization prior to pregnancy will have improved fetal outcomes also so a multidisciplinary team should plan this peripartum care the team uh, no, no, known as the pregnancy heart team it will usually consist of the obstetrician the uh, cardiologist the anesthesiologist and also the cardiovascular surgeon in severe cases so the optimal management of women with cardiovascular disease should become uh, should begin before conception that is based upon the baseline parameters if at the before conception when the patient is presenting we have to see if the patient is uh, is okay for uh, conception that is there, there should not be increased complications to the mother as well as the baby so if the patient's physiological condition is not uh, is is deranged at that moment then methods to mitigate the complication should be done and the prior treatment of the illness of the mother should be done before conception and also the physiological changes in pregnancy has known to exacerbate pre existing cardiac conditions as uh, rheumatic heart disease is com more common in developing countries like india we we'll emphasis on the pregnancy outcomes related with rheumatic heart disease a uh, women with mild and asymptomatic mitral valve disease tolerate pregnancy well with few complications well, and it is also known that stenotic lesions are less tolerated than regurgitative lesions and uh, the rate of hospitalization and the need uh, and heart failure is uh, high highest in patients with severe mitral stenosis and moderate mitral stenosis whereas a uh, women with mixed moderate to severe regurgitation along with stenotic lesions assured adverse pregnancy outcomes similar to those with severe mitral stenosis so from this it has been uh, known that uh, severe mitral stenosis is an independent risk factor for adverse perinatal outcomes and this data is from the rheumatic heart disease uh, in pregnancy data from the aha journal published in february 2018 so uh, the pregnancy is a state of uh, it appears physiological changes uh, present in the maternal uh, circulation as well as in other systems to accommodate for the maternal as well as the fetal needs so uh, primarily uh, looking into the cardiovascular changes of pregnancy by term uh, the cardiac output is known to increase almost 40 to 50% from the baseline stroke volume 30% increase heart rate 15 to 25% and also the intravascular volume increases by 45% and the red cell mass volume increases by 20% because there's a discordance between the increase in red cell mass and the intravascular volume physiological uh, anemia of pregnancy is common and the systemic vascular resistance decreases by 20% and this is because of the effect of progesterone the center where is the center of venous pressure is unchanged during pregnancy uh, auto conception increases by 30 to 40% and this is coupled along with a uh, decrease of uh, functional residual capacity in pregnancy hence patients who are planned for general anesthesia always considers as a difficult airway and also the apnea time will be less in patients because of increased auto conception as well as decreased frc uh, moving on to the hemodynamic changes during labor as we all know labor has been divided into four stages and uh, stage 1 is divided into latent and active phase in the latent phase there is 10% increase in cardiac output 
and in the active phase there is a 20 25% increase in the cardiac output and uh, immediate postpartum period shows the highest increase in cardiac output at uh, 75 to 80% from the baseline the heart rate and central venous pressure is increased in all stages of labor so the moving on to the peripheral changes within one hour after delivery cardiac output re still remains 30% above the pre labor values it uh, and by two weeks it is about 10% above 10% the pre pregnant values and by the end of 24 weeks that is 6 months it returns to the baseline pre pregnancy values uh, the heart rate immediately after delivery decreases and whereas in a two, by two weeks postpartum it returns to the pre pregnant values uh, the stroke volume uh, by 48 hours remains still remains above the pre labor values and by the end of 6 months it will re return to 10% above the pre pregnant values so moving on to the discussion on mitral stenosis, it, is, it frequently becomes symptomatic during pregnancy because of the various physiological changes associated in pregnancy, such as the hyperdynamic, hypovolemic state, and uh, also because of associated tachycardia in pregnancy, it will, it will exacerbate the manifestations of stenotic lesions. The etiology is almost invariably rheumatic in uh, developing countries like India. And uh, baseline poor functional status is associated with a greater risk for adverse perinatal outcomes. So, preconception treatment of symptomatic, moderate, or severe stenosis is preferred uh, before advising for conception. And the etiology of uh, mitral stenosis the most common etiology uh, is rheumatic heart disease, followed by a congenital parachute mitral valve, connective tissue disorders like Hunter's Furless syndrome. Uh, carcinoid syndrome, amyloidosis, rheumatoid arthritis, systemic lupus erythematosus, infective endocarditis, and annular calcifications. So, uh, moving on to the pathophysiology, we know that uh, my rheumatic heart disease is because of immune deactivity after infection with group A beta, hem beta hemolytic streptococci. The uh, immune reaction uh, occurs towards the basement membrane, globular basement membrane, as well as the uh, valvular uh, va valves in the heart. So, for the diagnosis of rheumatic uh, heart dis uh, rheumatic fever, uh, we, uh, we have the revised Jones criteria. So, for it, uh, the revised Jones criteria basically divides the population into a low risk and high risk population, depending upon the prevalence. A low risk population is the prevalence with the rheumatic heart disease incidence of less than or equal to one per uh, one lakh school going children, or the overall uh, incidence of less than or equal to one per 10,000 per thousand population. So other, other population are classified as moderate or high risk populations. For the first initial diagnosis of acute rheumatic fever, we need either pre presence of either one major criteria, uh, two major criteria, or one major criteria with two minor criteria, or either three, uh, three minor criteria. So the major criteria for low risk population are carditis, arthritis, which is uh, in low risk, only polyarthritis is included, chorea, subcutaneous nodules, erythema marginatum, and the minor criteria include polyarthralgia, fever more than or equal to 38.5 degrees Celsius, ESR elevated more than or equal to 60, and the CRP more than or equal to 3, with ECG changes of prolonged PRE interval according for age uh, variations. In moderate to high risk population, the difference between the main, uh, major and minor criteria is that in this, either monoarthritis or polyarthritis is also included in the major criteria, and polyarthralgia is also included. Whereas in minor criteria, instead of polyarthralgia, even the presence of one joint involvement, that is monoarthralgia, is also taken into account. So the pathophysiology, after the first episode of acute rheumatic carditis, the degree of inflammation can be either divided into mild to moderate inflammation or severe to fulminant in inflammation. This degree of inflammation will, de uh, will decide the sequelae uh, of the condition. So in uh, mild to uh, moderate inflammation, the patient can usually uh, go into recovery or if there are repeated ep mild episodes of acute rheumatic carditis, there is chronic caudal and mitral valve leaflet inflammation leading to matting fusion of the leaflet commissures. So in aged patients, there will be also associated calcification of the valve leading to a non-pliable mitral stenotic valve. Whereas in young patients, there is minimal cal calcification. So there will be mitral stenosis with pliable valves. Whereas in severe or fulminant inflammation, there is in acute cases, if the caudal inflammation is severe, it can lead to acute severe mitral regurgitation. Whereas in moderate uh, caudal and leaflet inflammation with repeated episodes will uh, cause uh, leaflet thickening and retraction, 
followed by fusion leading to a mixed lesion that is there'll be a mitral stenosis as well as regurgitation so moving on to the pathophysiology uh, per se if what happens in mitral stenosis is that because of progressive increase in the gradient across the left atrium and the left ventricle the left atrial pressure overload increases this leads to progressive dilatation of the left atrium and with the progressive dilatation there is a disarray of the fibers in the left atrium uh, and also with progressive inflammation there is fibrosis this will predispose the patient to atrial fibrillation and as atrial fibrillation progresses due to increased stasis of blood in the left atrium there is increased risk of formation of left, left atrial thrombus and also with progressive dilatation of the left atrium it can cause compression of the left ticker and laryngeal nerve leading to palsy this is the sequel of left atrial pressure overload this pressure overload will be transmitted to the pulmonary vasculature leading to pulmonary uh, venous hypertension followed by arterial hypertension this hypertension will lead to reactive medial hypertrophy and intermal hyperplasia and it, as the uh, hypertension further progresses it can lead to rv pressure overload and rv dilatation and the patient can go into right heart failure and also a functional tricuspid regurgitation will be associated in case of rv pressure overload so discussing these uh, hemodynamic changes on the pressure volume though as we can see uh, the the violet dot indicates the end systolic volume that is the mitral valve opens at that point followed which filling occurs and at the black point which is the end diastolic volume the mitral valve closes and the heart uh, blood from the mitral uh, sorry the left ventricle is ejaculated and uh, ejected and on uh, the stroke volume is uh, different is the difference between the end diastolic volume minus the end systolic volume as we can see that uh, the end diastolic volume decrease in the, in the second picture the end diastolic volume decrease is uh, more than the decrease in the end systolic volume and the stroke uh, volume invariably decreases uh, in mitral stenosis so why does pregnancy aggravate uh, mitral stenosis uh, the changes uh, are further aggravated by the physiological hypovolemia and uh, increased heart rate during pregnancy this increased uh, risk this will predispose the patient to increased risk of pulmonary edema and congestion uh, increased at atrial irritability and a hypercoagulable state increases risk of atrial fibrillation and left atrial thrombus as you know pregnancy is as such a hypercoagulable state due to decrease in uh, levels of protein c and protein s uh, also associated with increase in the levels of clotting factors so normal mitral valve orifice area is 4 to 6 cm square and the classic symptoms of mitral heart disease appear when the valve area is reduced to 2 cm square uh, the pressure gradient develops during diastole between the left atrium and the left ventricle and as the uh, pressure gradient further increases there is cardiac decompensation and the pulmonary edema which usually occurs in the second or third trimester of pregnancy as this, because the cardiac output increases maximum during that period Uh, the risk of maternal death is higher during labor and in the immediate postpartum period the sudden increase in preload immediately after delivery is due to auto transfusion from the uterus resulting in severe pulmonary edema it uh, with every uh, contraction there is a 15% increase in cardiac output as uh, 450 to 500 ml of blood is auto transfused into the central circulation with continuous auto transfusion of blood for 24 to 72 hours delivery almost a 45% increase in cardiac output occurs after delivery so the risk of pulmonary edema extends for several days after delivery and the greatest risk occurs in the peripartum period and major deaths occur between the 7th and 9th days postpartum hence more vigilance should be um, uh, there at, during this period and post op monitoring plays a great role in uh, early identification of uh, early detection of complications and management so the impact of preterm is, uh, is that there can be either preterm uh, birth still birth or neonatal death and the uh, various uh, impact on mother is that there can patient can go into pulmonary edema heart failure new or recurrent arrhythmias can occur and in severe cases even death can occur uh, moving on to the evaluation part pre pregnancy counseling uh, plays a very major role in the management of such patients uh the purpose of this is that the at the initial uh, visit risk assessment should be done followed by risk status stratification 
based on this we we should decide if this current physiological uh, is this current disease state of the patient is uh, okay for a patient to get uh, conceived and also to carry the pregnancy to term without any complications to the mother as well as the fetus if not if the patient requires management of a underlying cardiac condition before uh, prior to conception then that should be done so that there is a risk reduction and uh, methods to ma of management to mitigate complications should also be uh, employed so uh, during evaluation initially that we'll take a complete cardiac history followed by physical examination a 12 lead ecg and an echocardiography should be done so in history we'll ask for symptoms and signs to evaluate the disease severity the symptoms the common symptoms can be breathlessness uh, hemoptysis and cough it can all be due to pulmonary increased pulmonary congestion a uh, breathlessness is, all, is also due to low cardiac output state as stenotic lesions are fixed cardiac output state Hemoptysis could be because of pulmonary condition as well as if there is associated pulmonary embolism. A uh, fatigue in cases of chronic low cardiac output. Chest pain if there is associated a pulmonary hypertension. And if the as the disease progresses, patient can go into right heart failure, uh, leading to edema ascites. And if there is complicated atrial uh, complicated by atrial fibrillation, the patient can have palpitations. The clinical signs are. in case of atrial fibrillation patient will have palpitations and uh, this is this can be uh, atrial fibrillation as seen on ecg it could be due to atrial dilatation uh, mitral phases is because of uh, decreased uh, oxygen uh, extraction and low cardiac output state and also increased venous condition but as the patient is started on uh, 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 diuretics this this can resolve and it is not commonly seen in the indian uh, population because of the complexion uh and non auscultation that can be a loud first heart sound opening snap a mid diastolic murmur uh the pressure gradient because of the pre progressive pressure gradient across the valve and uh, crepitations because of uh, left heart failure pulmonary edema and uh, in in loud p2 and right uh, ventricular heave can be seen because of pulmonary hypertension so the murmur in ms is typically described as a low pitched rough rumbling mid diastolic murmur a heart with uh, with pre systolic accentuation best heard at the apex with bell of the stethoscope uh, low pitch murmurs are usually seen uh, or usually heard with the bell of the stethoscope rather than the diaphragm and left heart murmurs are uh, auscultated in the uh, left lateral decubitus position with the breath held in expiration this is the audio of a no normal heart sound so come and this is the heart sound of a murmur in ms so as we can hear uh, there is a pre systolic uh, attenuation with the mid diastolic murmur and uh, as the disease uh, progresses the duration of uh, opening snap will uh, decrease uh, moving on to the ecg changes there is the presence of p mitral that is bifid p waves because of left atrial enlargement and uh, in case of progressive pulmonary hypertension features of right ventricular hypertrophy can be seen like uh, tall r waves in v1 uh, the chest x ray findings are straightening of upper left cardiac border due to the enlargement of left atrial appendage posterior displacement of esophagus by enlarged uh, left atrium double shadow behind the heart on uh, pa films and uh, curly v lines if there is associated pulmonary congestion and on the lateral or oblique x rays we can see the presence of calcifications in the mitral valve so the other modalities which can help in the disease uh, in risk stratification or if to identify complications is cardiac enzymes but their significance in pregnancy is low because the pregnancy pregnancy state as such will lead to increase in the levels of these enzymes a uh, few such enzymes are the bnp which is brain natriuretic peptide in uncomplicated pregnancy bnp levels are doubled and return to baseline 3 days after delivery and it is also increased in patients with preeclampsia and heart disease hence it it, it doesn't have much role in uh, classification of heart failure or to identify heart failure in pregnant patients and other cardiac enzymes such as troponin it is not elevated above the upper limits in uncomplicated pregnancy but uh, it is elevated in women with gestational hypertension and preeclampsia and the ckmb levels are elevated up to 2 to 4 times the upper limit due to the presence of these enzymes in the uterus and placenta hence to identify myocardial ischemia in pregnant patients troponin has more sensitivity than ckmb 
moving on to the cardiovascular imaging modalities in pregnancy echocardiography is safe and an invasive method uh, can be done uh, performed at all stages of pregnancy and we can see the valve morpho morphology we can calculate the left atrial uh, uh, dilatation left atrial pressures and also it will, uh, we can assess the pressure half time to classify the severity of mitral stenosis. It will also allow for the assessment of the intravascular volume status. In the first image, which is the uh, long axis view, we can see that uh, a left atrial enlargement is present because of uh, the stenosis of the mitral valve. And in this uh, video, the apical uh, four chamber view, we can see that the movement of the mitral valve is limited leading to stenosis and left atrial enlargement. Other imaging modalities during pregnancy, uh, but it does not have much role. Uh, if cardiac MRI, no evidence that MRI causes harm to the fetus. But the use of gadolinium contrast should be done in pregnancy only if significantly improves the diagnostic performance. And uh, cardiac catheterization is the gold standard for diagnosis of uh, coronary uh, uh, artery disease, uh, but it's not usually done during uh, pregnancy unless uh, required. Then during the procedure, left lateral decubitus should be maintained to prevent iota cable compression. CT angio has high uh, ra radiation doses and hence not done in the initial trimesters. Uh, intravenous contrast medium load is greater and the fetal exposure, even though external shielding is done, it can be ineffective because uh, the indirect scatter of radiation can occur, still causing the ra ionization radiation injury. And the safest approach is to avoid ionizing radiation during pregnancy. So the classification of uh, mitral uh, stenosis uh, based upon the following parameters. Uh, the normal mitral valve area is 4 to 6 centimeters square with a mean pressure gradient between the left atrium and left ventricle which is less than 2 millimeters of mercury. And the normal pulmonary artery mean pressures are 10 to 20 millimeters of mercury. In mild cases, the valve area is 1.5 to 2.5, whereas in moderate, it is 1 to 1.5, and in severe, it is less than 1 centimeter square. The mean pressure gradient in uh, mild cases is 2 to 6, moderate 6 to 12, and in severe, it is more than 12 millimeters of mercury. And the pulmonary artery uh, pressure is uh, less than 30 in mild cases. In moderate cases, it is 30 to 50, and in severe cases, it is more than 50. So in this uh, image, we can see the first picture is the uh, no, with the normal area, which is four to six centimeters square. And with progressive stenosis, the in mild cases, which is uh, 1.5 uh, to uh, 2.5 centimeters square. At uh, rest, all the parameters are normal, but on, exa on exertion, uh, the, in, the, there is increase in the left atrial pressures, pulmonary artery pressures. And in moderate cases, even at rest, there is an elevation of the left atrial and pulmonary artery pressures. And in severe cases, the cardiac output is also compromised. So uh, moving on to cardiac risk prediction, the NYHA and heart failure stage classifications predict risk in non-pregnant population. Uh, whereas uh, carpreg uh, is, uh, which is cardiac disease uh, in pregnancy and modified WHO risk scores are used for cardiac risk stratification during pregnancy. The NIHA functional classification of heart failure is Class 1, there is no limitation of physical activity. In class 2, there is mild limitation where, and uh, regular physical activity causes symptoms. In class 3, there is marked limitation of physical activity, no symptoms at rest, and minimal activity causes symptoms. And in class 4, symptoms at rest is present. So the uh, de development of heart failure is uh, divided into four stages. In stage A, the patient is at risk for heart failure, but without structural heart disease or symptoms. In stage B, there is structural heart disease, but without signs or symptoms. In stage C, there is structural heart disease with prior or current symptoms of heart failure. And in stage 4, there is refractory heart failure requiring specialized interventions. The CARPREC 2 score uh, risk predictor components are uh, prior cardiac events or arrhythmias, a baseline NIHA class of 3 to 4 or the presence of cyanosis, a presence of mechanical valve, left ventricular ejection fraction less than 55%, high-risk valve disease or with LVOT obstruction, a pulmonary hypertension, RVSP more than 49 millimeters of uh, mercury, high risk of iotopathy, his prior history of coronary artery disease, and uh, no prior cardiac intervention and late pregnancy assessment carries scores of 1 each. Uh, 
Why WHO cardiac risk assessment is a commonly used one and during pregnancy. In class one, there is no increase or a mild increase in morbidity. And the following conditions are included. Mild pulmonic stenosis, PDA, mitral valve prolapse repaired, or uh, successfully repaired uh, ASD, VASD, PDA, anomalous pulmonary venous uh, return. And the morbidity in these patients is 2.5 to 5%. In class two, there is a small increase in maternal mortality, a moderate increase in and a moderate increase in maternal morbidity is seen. And this includes unrepaired ASD or VASD, a repaired tetralogy of phallic, most arrhythmias, Turner syndrome without aortic dilation. And the risk, risk for morbidity in these patients is 5.7 to 10%. In class 2 to 3, uh, intermediate increase in maternal mortality and a moderate to severe increase in maternal morbidity is seen. Uh, the conditions include mild left ventricular ejection fraction impairment and the ejection fraction is, fraction is more than 45%. Hypertropic obstructive cardiomyopathy, uh, Marfan syndrome without aortic uh, dilatation, aorta less than 45 millimeters in a bicuspid aortic valve pathology, repaired coarctation of aorta, and uh, atrioventricular septal defects, unrepaired. And in this case, the morbidity is 10% to 19%. In class 3, there is significant increase in maternal mortality and severe increase in maternal morbidity. Uh, this will include conditions where there's a presence of a mechanical valve, systemic uh, right ventricular involvement, fontan circulation, underpaired cyanotic heart disease, complex congenital heart diseases, or a Marfan syndrome with aortic dilation 40 to 45 millimeters, and, uh, and bicuspid aortic valve with the aortic dilatation of 45 to 50. And the morbidity in these patients is 19% uh, to 27%. Uh, Class four in which pregnancy is not recommended or, uh, it, and it will include, include the following conditions. Pulmonary heart rate hypertension of any cause, severe left ventricular dysfunction, previous peripartum cardiomyopathy with uh, residual left ventricular dysfunction, severe mitral stenosis and severe aortic stenosis, Marfan syndrome with aortic dilatation more than 45 millimeters, bicuspid aortic valve with aortic dilation more than 50 millimeters, severe unrepaired co uh, aortic coarctation. And in this class, the morbidity risk almost reaches 40 to 100 percent. Uh, the management part will be discussed by my colleague, Dr. Uh, Sandi. Thank you, Chandni, for a, such a nice presentation. Dr. Sandeep, you can, yeah, please start. Thank you, Chandani. Uh, good evening, everyone. Now, I'll be discussing the management of mitral stenosis in pregnancy. I would like to discuss the management under three clinical scenarios. The first scenario is of a woman who has been diagnosed with mitral stenosis and who wishes to conceive in future. The second scenario is of a woman who is pregnant and has been diagnosed with mitral stenosis during her pregnancy. And the third scenario is of a pregnant woman with prosthetic valve. The first scenario, in a patient who has already been diagnosed with mitral stenosis and wishes to conceive in future, in such patients, a preconceptional education to the female and the family regarding the disease, its course, and its possible impact on the mother and fetus must be explained. The type and the severity of the disease must be assessed, and any history of pulmonary edema, arrhythmias, transient ischemic attacks, or stroke prior to pregnancy shall be inquired and noted. The functional status of the patient must be assessed and it can be assessed either objectively or subjectively. Subjectively, it is done by NYHA functional class and objectively, it is done by exercise testing. Usually, patients with severe mitral stenosis and pulmonary hypertension are counseled against pregnancy and are referred to the cardiologist for further optimization. In an already diagnosed uh, woman, uh, they shall be under medical management with drugs such as beta blockers. Beta blockers are used to control the heart rate and the target heart rate in mitral stenosis is between 50 and 70 beats per minute. Uh, tachycardia is uh, detrimental in such patients because mitral stenosis is considered to be a fixed cardiac output syndrome. And by increasing the heart rate, we'll be decreasing the left ventricular filling and also increasing the left ventricular pressures. 
by decreasing the left ventricular filling you will be reducing the cardiac output further hence beta blockers are important in the management of mitral stenosis patients will also be on diuretics such as furosemide to reduce the volume overload if the patient is in atrial fibrillation drugs such as digoxin and beta blockers shall be prescribed for the rate and rhythm control mitral stenosis with atrial fibrillation uh, can lead to thrombus formation and such patients are also started on anticoagulation the drug of choice is warfarin and the target inr is between 2.5 and 3.5 if on the, like based on the clinical and uh, imaging modalities if the woman is found to have moderate or severe mitral stenosis with valve area of less than 1.5 cm square or in severe symptomatic patients and patients with reduced exercise capacity interventional procedures like percutaneous balloon valvuloplasty may also be advised uh, these patients either after medical management or interventional uh, procedures they are assessed at a later date and based on the clinical status and the functional status at that time uh, the pregnancies can be planned accordingly coming to the second scenario where a pregnant woman has been diagnosed with mitral stenosis during her pregnancy in such cases we have to assess the female with respect to clinical signs and symptoms assess the functional status of the patient assess the severity of the lesion with the help of 2d echocardiography where we look for the mitral valve area the extent of mitral regurgitation is present the left ventricular systolic functions and the systolic pulmonary artery pressures if based on the clinical and uh, echo finding if the patient is found to have severe mitral stenosis with pulmonary artery hypertension severe left ventricular dysfunction with lvf of less than 40% and in severe symptomatic lesions where uh, percutaneous mitral commissuratomy or valvuloplasty is contraindicated such as in the presence of large la clots or presence of other valvular lesions and uh, uh, abnormal valve morphology in such patients early termination of pregnancy is usually advised but based on the assessment if the pregnancy is considered safe to be continued then management is started with bed rest salt restriction diuretics and beta blockers and interventional procedures like a balloon mitral valvuloplasty or balloon mitral commissuratomy is advised and the indic indications are symptomatic cases where medical management has failed and in patients with severe mitral stenosis where the mitral valve area is less than 1 cm square among the interventional procedures the procedure of choice is percutaneous balloon mitral valvuloplasty and echocardiographic based scoring system wilkins system is done Like which determines the suitability for percutaneous balloon mitral valvuloplasty. The procedure is ideally performed after 12 to 14 weeks of gestation, which will minimize minimize the fetal radiation exposure. But if the patient can be stabilized with medical management, then the procedure can be delayed up to 26 to 30 weeks of gestation, which will also reduce the risk for preterm delivery. Now we shall discuss the role of anticoagulation in pregnancy. pregnancy as such is considered to be a hypercoagulable state where all the clotting factors increase except factor 11 and 13 and uh, in addition a presence of a cardiac disease can further increase the chances of uh, thrombus formation in such patients and the indications for anticoagulation are mitral stenosis with atrial fibrillation which can cause stasis of blood and clot formation prior embolic events even in sinus rhythm and severe mitral stenosis with left atrial diameter of more than 55 mm on 2d echo the commonly used anticoagulants are warfarin and fractionated heparin low molecular weight heparin and aspirin as per the traditional teaching warfarin is usually contraindicated or avoided in the first trimester of pregnancy due to the risk of uh, fetal embryopathy but uh, as per the current recommendations or guidelines if the daily dose of warfarin required to maintain the target inr is between 2.5 to 3.5 then warfarin can be safely continued even in the first trimester uh, if the daily dose of warfarin uh, required to maintain the target inr is more than 5 mg per day then we have to go for the alternatives such as unfractionated heparin or low molecular weight heparin unfractionated heparin is monitored by aptt levels which must be twice the control values and low molecular weight heparin which is administered subcutaneously uh, at least twice daily in the first trimester uh, must be monitored by anti factor 10a levels but if it is not available aptt can be used as a monitoring guide aspirin in the dose of 75 to 100 mg daily is recommended in second and third trimesters in addition to warfarin or heparin 
once the patient is uh, optimized medically and by interventional procedures the next comes the obstetric and anesthetic management of such patients management of mitral stenosis in pregnancy should be a multidisciplinary approach which must include the obstetricians anesthesiologist and the cardiologist the assessment of the cardiac lesion severity of the lesion and management should be discussed and the appropriate mode of delivery must be planned irrespective of the mode of the delivery plan intense hemodynamic monitoring should be done at least for 48 to 72 hours after delivery the mode of delivery could be either vaginal delivery or cesarean delivery vaginal delivery is usually preferred in patients with mild to moderate mitral stenosis in patients belonging to nyh class 1 to 2 and if there is no associated pulmonary artery hypertension whenever vaginal mode of delivery is planned the role of anesthesiologist here is to provide labor analgesia to the patient and the anesthesiologist must educate and counsel the uh, female regarding the benefits of epidural uh, of labor analgesia in, in such conditions and if the patient is willing the anesthesiologist may go for uh, insertion of epidural for providing labor analgesia however uh, whenever we provide labor epidural we must avoid large bolus doses and also a close hemodynamic monitoring is required as epidural analgesia may lead to hypotension and during the second uh, stage of labor to avoid the hemodynamic consequences that, that occurs during the bearing down efforts of the mother assisted vaginal delivery with the help of vacuum or forceps is performed uh, the large increase in venous return that occurs during the second stage of labor may predispose the patients to heart failures cesarean delivery is preferred in patients with uh, severe mitral stenosis in patients belonging to functional uh, nyh functional class 3 or 4 when there is uh, pulmonary artery hypertension and for obstetrical indications the advantages of cesarean section are that it avoids the hemodynamic consequences of labor but the disadvantages are that vasodilatation and hemodynamic disturbances that can occur during the induction of anesthesia cesarean section is associated with large volume shifts and maintenance of uh, perfusion pressures in such cases could be det- detrimental and worsening of pulmonary artery hypertension with positive pressure ventilation when the patient is under general anesthesia irrespective of the choice of anesthesia once the patient is planned for cesarean section there are certain goals of anesthetic management that have to be followed in patients with mitral stenosis the goals of the anesthetic management are maintenance of low normal heart rate and preservation of sinus rhythm avoidance of aorta cable compression maintenance of adequate preload maintenance of adequate systemic vascular resistance avoid sudden decreases in systemic vascular resistance prevention of pain hypoxemia hypercarbia and acidosis which will increase the pulmonary artery pressures also treat atrial fibrillation if present the choice of anesthesia could be either neuroaxial anesthesia or general anesthesia if the valve area is more than 1.5 cm square and there is no associated pulmonary artery hypertension neuroaxial anesthesia is generally well tolerated in such patients and the goals are to maintain sinus rhythm and prevent, uh, prevent tachycardia increase in preload is not well tolerated and fluids must be administered judiciously in such patients and monitor closely for volume overload during the 42 uh, during the first 48 to 72 hours after delivery if the valve area is less than 1.5 cm square with a presence of pulmonary artery hypertension these patients are considered to be under high risk group and the goals are again to maintain the sinus rhythm and prevent tachycardia increase in preload is again not well tolerated in such patients address any new onset atrial fibrillation prevent or treat pain hypoxemia hypercarbia and acidosis in patients with mild to moderate mitral stenosis neuroaxial techniques either for neuroaxial analgesia or anesthesia may be safely used in such patients adequate analgesia during the first stage of labor is essential and it can be provided either by intrathecal or epidural administration of an opioid uh, which will provide adequate analgesia and also the advantage of using opioid in first stage is that uh, it does not cause any sympathetic blockage in the second uh, stage of the labor we can provide uh, neuroaxial administration of an opioid with small dose of local anesthetic which provides satisfactory analgesia for the patients 
and any hypotension must be treated with the direct acting vasopressors like phenylephrine. Uh, whenever the patient is posted for cesarean uh, uh, section, uh, the uh, neural anesthetic technique should be uh, a titratable technique. It could be either epidural anesthesia or sequential combined spinal epidural anesthesia. Combined spinal and epidural is usually preferred in these patients, and we have to maintain a, a judicious load administration and titrate phenylephrine to maintain the hemodynamic stability. The advantages of epidural in such patients are it decreases the preload, decreases the afterload. You can use epidural for providing labor analgesia, and the, and the same epidural can be used to convert to the epidural anesthesia if required. And the advantages of combined spinal epidural are you can start off with a low spinal dose, around 2.5 to 5 mg, which is around 0.5 to 1 ml of hyperbaric bupivacaine. And the effect can be titrated to a level of T4 to T6 with the help of epidural. Uh, the advantages of combined spinal epidural are the less incidence of maternal hypotension and low doses of local anesthetics can be used. Uh, regarding the perioperative management of patients who are on anticoagulation and, and are planned for neuralgia procedures, if the patient is on unfractionated heparin, which is low dose, then and we also have to look for the time since the last dose. Unfractionated heparin, low dose, at the time since last dose is more than four to six hours, then we can safely proceed with neuralgia lab procedures. If the patient is on unfractionated heparin, either intermediate or uh, high dose, we are, again, we have to look for the time since the last dose. For intermediate doses, 12 hours is considered to be the cutoff time, and for high doses, 24 hours is considered to be the cutoff time. If adequate criteria is met, then the patients can be uh, safely proceeded with the neuralgia techniques. If the conditions are not met or if their coagulation status are uh, deteriorated or deranged, in such patients, we have to assess the difficult airway in such patients. And pregnant females are as such considered to be a difficult airway. And the risks of GA must be compared with the uh, incidence of spinal epidural hematomas in such patients. And if, if the coagulation factors and the time duration are not met, then we have to abandon for the neuralgia procedures and go for general anesthesia in such patients. If the patient is on LMWH, if the patient is on LMWH and low dose, again uh, prophylactic dose we can we can stop for twelve hours before the procedure, and for high uh, high dose LMWH or therapeutic LMWH, twenty four hours in uh, before the procedure is usually recommended, and if the time duration is met, uh, these patients are considered to be low risk for the neuralgia procedures. And can be safely uh, proceeded with the neuralgia techniques. If the time duration or the laboratory values are not in favorable uh, way for uh, neuralgia techniques, then we have to go for uh, general anesthesia in such patients. The indications of general anesthesia in mitral stenosis are severe mitral stenosis with pulmonary artery hypertension, refusal to neuralgia anesthesia, and presence of any other contraindications to neuralgia techniques. Once the patient is planned for general anesthesia, we have to uh, ensure that uh, consider all pregnant women as full stomach and ensure the aspiration prophylaxis is given as per the institutional protocol. Arrange for blood products as needed on a case to case basis. Yeah, a written high risk consent must be taken, which must explain the procedure, the mode of anesthesia, the complications, and also the uh, possibility of post operative mechanical ventilation in such patients. And the requirement of ICU bed. Keep emergency drugs, difficult airway cart, and defibrillator ready. Attach monitors as per ASA standard monitoring guidelines. Secure arterial line based on patient status and monitor early urine output. The technique of induction would be modified rapid sequence induction using either atomidate or propofol titrated to the effect. Uh, ketamine and thiopentone are usually avoided because they can cause tachycardia. Avoid laryngoscopy response to intubation. Keep a short acting beta blockers like esmolol or xyloka 2% IV preparation ready to blunt the hemodynamic responses. Avoid nitrous oxide during maintenance as it, it can increase pulmonary vascular resistance, which is detrimental in patients with pulmonary artery hypertension. Maintenance of anesthesia with uh, oxygen and sevoflurin. Avoid relaxants with histamine release such as atratorium. Maintain normothermia. Use short acting beta blockers such as esmolol for rate control. Intraoperative fluid should be carefully titrated 
to avoid the fluid overload and avoid intraoperative hypoxia, hypercarbia, and acidosis. And once the uh, woman delivers, the, once the baby is out, we have to administer uterotonics such as oxytocin. Uh, oxytocin in cardiac disease is usually administered with bolus dose of 2 units IV over 15 to 20 minutes, followed by an infusion of 1 to 2 units per hour for the next 4 hours. Avoid uterotonics such as methergine and carboprost. Um, since they can increase the pulmonary vascular resistance. And once the uh, closure is done, uh, the patients must be extubated. Extubation should be smooth. Avoid any hemodynamic uh, fluctuations. The patient must be completely awake and following command and only then extubated. Postoperatively, continuous vitals monitoring has to be done for the next 72 hours. Avoid hypothermia. A shivering can increase myocardial oxygen demand by 300 to 400 times. Administer fluids judiciously. Use multimodal balanced analgesic techniques to prevent any undue sympathetic stimulation. And hourly monitoring of urine output must be continued. Under the multimodal analgesic techniques, we can go for systemic uh, analgesics such as opioids, paracetamol, or NSAIDs. We can use truncal blocks such as truncal subdominus plane block quadratus lumborum block and erectus spinae plane block. If an epidural was already present or, or if we have used continuous spinal catheter for uh, analgesia or anesthesia, we can use the same catheters for post-operative analgesia as well. On the resumption of anticoagulation post-operatively, therapeutic LMWH should not be resumed no sooner than 12 hours post-operatively. Warfarin can be restarted 24 hours post-operatively. Coming to the third scenario, uh, where a patient with a prosthetic valve is conceived, uh, and in such patients, we must consider the details of the surgery, the type of the prosthetic valve, whether it is me mechanical valve or bioprosthetic valve, cardiologist evaluation to assess for the functional status of the patient, and also for the 2D echocardiography as to uh, assess the severity of the lesion and to also rule out the other uh, coexisting diseases. And also the cardiologist must plan for the anticoagulant therapy in such patients and laboratory parameters such as INR, PT, epitetic have to be determined. Mechanical valve usually requires lifelong anticoagulation, but bioprosthetic valve requires anticoagulation only for the first three months following its placement. Anticoagulation uh, in the first trimester, we usually avoid warfarin or warfarin with uh, total daily dose of less than 5 mg can be continued. From 12 weeks to 36 weeks of gestation, consider anticoagulation with warfarin with target INR of 2.5 and 3.5. And at 36 weeks, we must stop warfarin and bridge with heparin. And therapeutic uh, LMWH must be stopped 24 hours prior to surgery. Prophylactic LMWH must be stopped at least 12 hours prior to surgery. And warfarin must be discontinued five days before the surgery. In an emergency and in patients on oral anticoagulation, uh, we must consider the strategies to reverse warfarin. The strategies to reverse warfarin are vitamin K, 10 mg IV at a rate of 1 mg per minute to reduce the anaphylaxis. And prothrombin complex concentrates, either PCC4 or PCC3 can be administered to the patient. And the dose of PCC3 or PCC4 depends on the INR values. If PCC com if prothrombin complex concentrates are not available, then we have to consider fresh frozen plasma at the dose of 12 to 15 ml per kg to reverse warfarin. But it usually takes a longer time, around 8 to 12 hours, to reverse the warfarin. And in patients who have been on unfractionated heparin or low molecular weight heparin, protein should be used to reverse in, a, in an emergency. Next, the role of infectious undercurrent prophylaxis in such patients. Prophylaxis is controversial and there is lack of convincing evidence. If already on treatment, the treatment has to be continued and the antibiotics should be given according to the guidelines guided by the culture and the antibiotic sensitivity results. These are our references. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Chandini and Dr. Sandeep for your very wonderful and informative presentations. You have aptly covered the entire physiological and the pathological concepts of mitral stenosis and their consequences in 
प्रेगनेंसी एंड दस द एनेस्थेटिक मैनेजमेंट मे आई नाउ रिक्वेस्ट प्रोफेसर अग्रवाल सर एंड डॉक्टर ममता सिन्हा मैडम टू टेक फॉरवर्ड द सेशन एंड वी हैव फ्यू क्वेरीज इन द चैट बॉक्स वी कैन टेक द क्वेरीज फ्रॉम द चैट बॉक्स एंड डिस्कस द रिलीवेंट की होम मैसेजेस फॉर टूडेज ऑडियंस okay so uh, thank you ankur sir uh, we have received few questions in the chat box first question to dr sandeep can we give labor epidural analgesia if the patient is on anticoagulant dr sandeep would you like to answer ma'am uh, like in like, like if the patient is on anticoagulation like we must, and if i have to provide uh, labor analgesia use of epidural uh, is actually becomes little uh, Uh, controversial no? because we cannot uh, like we have to monitor for the diagnostic of the patient and also if the patient is on lmwh or uh, unfractionated heparin uh, uh, the risks of spinal epidural hematomas could be there so it's better we stop on the anticoagulants before instituting the epidurals we can provide other means of labor analgesia such as systemic or uh, oral uh, uh, analgesic techniques but uh, neurological technique should be better avoided if the patient is on anticoagulants okay okay uh, thank you sandeep but uh, what i would like to add upon here is that if adequate time intervals between the stoppage of anticoagulant has been maintained according to the asra guidelines we can continue with the epidural uh, putting an epidural catheter and going with that if uh, like after prophylactic doses of lmwh if 12 hours of an interval is maintained and after therapeutic doses 24 hours and photosex has after an unfractionated dose of heparin we can continue with epidural analgesia okay okay so uh, dr chandni one more question we have received is uh, someone wants to know what is the mechanism of hemoptysis chandni please hand yes ma'am as there is a progressive increase in uh, pressure in the pulmonary vasculature ma'am pulmonary hypertension occurs Uh, which will lead to the rupture of the terminal bronchioles and the bronchopulmonary anastomosis this will lead to hemoptysis okay um one more interesting question is there in the chat box what is the dose of local anesthetic for epidural anesthesia dr sandeep ma'am here we usually go like once the patient is on labor uh, epidural and uh, if we have to take the patient for anesthesia what we usually do here is we, we administer around 10 to 15 ml of uh, lignocaine uh, 2% lignocaine and then uh, we administer 1 ml of soda bicarbonate and then we wait for the epidural if not we can uh, directly go with the bupivacaine around uh, 10 to 15 ml of 0.5% bupivacaine see first of all we should always give a titrated dose hai na we should always be giving in titrated doses first we have to give in alicots and then we have to see the what is the level achieved and then only we can increase the doses okay uh, i hope that explains the answer we can give uh, around we can start with 3 to 4 ml of 0.5% bupivacaine and then uh, after checking the levels then we can give in alicots okay then uh, one more question we have received in the chat box role of non invasive ventilation and management if the patient is in failure in 32 weeks of gestation okay okay dr sandeep any comments now if the patient is in failure uh, like uh, for initial stabilization we may use an iv uh, for the patient but then if the patient is failure then the uh, the definitive management is termination of pregnancy in the termination of pregnancy we must go for uh, ga in such patients so i, I did it with them like it goes into endotracheal intubation only for that patients so and i may be used for initial stabilization phase of patient yes uh, anyone else would like to comment uh, agrawal sir okay uh, yes uh, an iv non invasive we have to go for termination of pregnancy if the patient is in going in failure even if it is 32 weeks uh, we have to like uh, uh, we will have to go for a, a emergency cesarean section and uh, we will have to go for intubation and uh, uh, 
go for delivery okay uh, okay one more question is there in the chat box is propofol a better choice of inducing agent than thiopentone or opioids with benzodiazepines okay uh, dr sandeep is propofol a better choice for inducing the patient Ma'am, what induction uh, agent would you like, like to use? We, uh, like in our institute, ma'am, like we usually use propofol or etomidate as induction agents in such cases. We usually avoid benzodiazepines such as midazolam, uh, and, and, and that because of its, uh, it can it can cause the placental barrier and can lead to floppy baby syndromes. So our usual technique of induction is we administer fentanyl around twenty to twenty five to fifty mg, and then propofol or etomidate titrated to the effect. We, no, then what would be the preferred agent, Sandeep? Would you like to use propofol? Etomidate would be the preferred agent. Yeah, because propofol would it's further lead to a decrease in it. And... Anna, so it would not be a preferred agent. The preferred agent would be etomidate. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. And uh, what is the advantage of placenta? So, Question: Will lignocaine two percent alone uh, provide adequate epidural anesthesia in terms of motor blockade? Lignocaine two percent alone. So lignocaine two percent alone uh, like can provide the onset of motor blockade, but to maintain it, we might have to give top ups of lignocaine point five percent also during the surgery. Okay. Next question is, uh, what is the role of segmental spinal anesthesia in such patients? Sir, for cesarean section, we usually require a level up to T4 to T6. So the role of segmental spine, I don't think is uh, helpful in such cases. Sandeep, mm -hmm. uh, I will tell you one thing. It is not in our syllabus of the post-graduation. Segmental spinal is an evolving technique when it considers the risk of two lives okay there we are not going to be adventurous or taking undue risk in putting up a technique to prove our glory or something like that better stick to the basic principles which have been taught in the textbooks and by the teachers many techniques will be coming up segmental or many other or you can say blocks also will coming up but what are the basics we have to prevent the life of two people, whether it's in a tertiary care institution like Ames Raipur or even in the peripheral centers. So uh, if, you know, if you answer in the question, uh, in the examination also, you will be answering non-segmental techniques, not the segmental. It's a good technique, but in the hands of a postgraduate student, you cannot consider them as a safe. I don't know the teachers, how they are also teaching in different institutions of the country. So, in, especially in the cases of a cardiac case and that too with the pregnancy, we stick to the basics to save the life of the patient. Safety is the first priority for all. That should be the answer. Okay. Yes. yes. Thank you, sir. Sandeep, next question is, is soda bicarbonate still recommended as adjuvant in epidural? Would you like to use it for fastening the block? Speed of onset of the block? But, uh, like we have used it in a couple of places and it has worked here. But uh, as such, it is not recommended in any guidelines. So, like soda backup only not be used in uh, every case. Dr. Mamta, your opinion on it? Uh, so mostly we are not using soda bica for uh, epidural uh, in epidural anesthesia. And uh, we should actually we should go with bopivacaine if it is a very like uh, we have to, uh, very emergency situation, we can go for 2% lignocaine, but 0.5% bopivacaine is definitely the preferred choice. Thank you. Another important question is, if the uh, mitral stenosis is complicated with mitral regurgitation, how does the anesthesia management changes? Uh -huh. This is a typical question for Sandeep. Let him answer or Chandani answer because that can come in examination also. MS with MR in pregnancy. Sir, uh, in the case with MS and MR, uh, uh, I would like to go for general anesthesia sir, because the hemodynamics in such cases will be in a better controlled 
under general than with uh, regional techniques. And um, like individually MS, like you can see where MS, uh, the regional is contraindicated. And in, uh, in MR, uh, like the regional is uh, okay to go with. But when there is a mix of both the conditions, then I prefer going for general anesthesia uh, than for regional techniques. That's a okay. good answer, actually, because even in the our teaching schedules and our teaching, you know, period time also, although the anesthesiology has advanced to a greater level in the last two decades, whenever in doubt in a cardiac patient, it is always prudent to resort to the general anesthesia than the regional techniques. Uh, I'm not biased toward the airway management. Airway management is altogether a different issue for these type of patients. But whenever a cardiac patient with a, because half of the things you may not be knowing, the pathophysiology, the eco findings may be different. Clinically, under stress condition, those findings become different. So under general anesthesia, you can control the hemodynamics. You can control so many things in a much, much nice manner as compared to regional where the things will go uncontrolled. You cannot titrate them. But under GA, you can always titrate them. Dr. Naveen wants to say something. He wants to add something here. Un un unmute, unmute yourself, person. Just wait. Sorry, sorry. Sorry, sorry. Just wait. No, you can unmute yourself. Yeah, uh, Sandeep, see, this is a very typical examination question about uh, having two lesions simultaneously. Uh, the good answer would have been, uh, you have rightly explained, but see, majority of the patients would have both the lesions together. MS with some element of MR, but you have to go for the, Dr. Nandisho will agree with me, you have to go for the predominant lesion, mm -hmm. which is more severe yes. and tackle the patient according to that. And Dr. Bajwaj very rightly said about general anesthesia, but the question was, if it is both MS with MR, which will, it will be your priority? So the lesion, answer is the lesion, which is more predominant, takes the priority. Thank you, sir. So one more question is there, which I think which vasopressor may be better if there is hypotension? Sandeep, you uh, yes, yes. Which uh, vasopressor uh, would be preferred if there is hypotension? is usually con is considered the ideal agent uh, to increase the BP in such patients. Uh, and uh, if phenylephrine usually uh, like even neuraxial administration, the like neuraxial techniques are there, and then patient is in hypotension because of neuraxial energy or anything, you can go with uh, infusion of phenylephrine also. And the dose is around 0.5 to 0.75 mics per kg per minute infusion, uh, which can maintain the hemodynamics. If uh, phenylephrine is not able to maintain the hemodynamics, then we can go for uh, norepinephrine as the do as the best producer of choice. Good. I would uh, I would rather agree to it. And uh, Madhuri, ma'am, uh, you can unmute and uh, give your opinion, ma'am. No, ma I don't want to give opinion on this question. I've got another question. Okay, okay ma'am, please, please, please go ahead, ma'am. Okay. Uh, Dr. Uh, Sandeep, uh, yes, how, will you, how will you grade the risk in this case, the cardiac risk? What is the risk of cardiac complications in this pregnant woman with a valvular heart disease who is taken for cesarean section? Uh, if she's talking about risk stratification. Yeah, risk stratification. Nowadays, that is very important. How to grade the risk. So usually, we, uh, for cardiac patients, we usually do this reverse cardiac risk index and the Gupta's risk index. Yeah. Gupta score. You are right. But in pregnant patients, we have got some uh, scores which have been uh, well validated. So, I'll just add these to your uh, presentation. One is the car preg risk score. So the CARPREG risk score, the risk factors include the prior cardiac event or arrhythmia. Then New York Heart Association plus NYHA plus more than two or cyanosis. Then uh, presence of left heart obstruction. And uh, next is ejection fraction less than 40%. So the score and risk of cardiac complications accordingly is 0.5%, 1 to 27% and 2 to 75% risk, okay? And then there is one more risk score, the Zahara risk score, which includes risk factors like history of arrhythmia, cardiac medication prior to pregnancy, 
NYHA class more than two, left heart obstruction, then uh, uh, valve regurgitation, and uh, uh, these points are there. And um, again, the scoring can be done. And one more, we have the WHO classification for pregnancy. I'm sure you must, you must have heard of this. The WHO classification for pregnancy, where class one is there is no detectable increased risk of maternal mortality or morbidity. And, um, and the next is there is a small increased risk of maternal mortality or moderate increase. And two to three is depending on the patient. So there are various criteria in that which we can use to risk stratify the patient. Okay. Yes. Hello, Madhuri ma'am. Yeah, it was there in our presentation. Yes. Chapter Sandeep has already okay. presented Dr. this. Dr. Chandni, that is why I asked him the scores. I asked Chandni actually presented the Carpreg score, which I think he has to, he has told. Is it? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yes. Carpreg okay, okay, so score and modified WHO scoring system. It right. Correct. Ma'am, Zahara scoring is mostly for congenital heart disease, and modified WHO scoring system is the best score to predict. Uh, for risk stratification in a patient with a valvular uh, heart disease. Exactly. Exactly. Okay, thank you so much, ma'am, for your inputs. Okay. Uh, Another question is, uh, what is the role of invasive blood pressure and central venous pressure in conducting a case of severe MS? Is it mandatory or is it optional? Dr. Sandeep, would you like to comment? Um, uh, the role of arterial is definitely mandatory in, uh, in severe mitral stenosis because severe mitral stenosis patients are prone for uh, like various hemodynamic fluctuations during the case. So it, it will guide us a bit to bit variation is uh, or monitoring is required in such patients. The role for central venous pressure monitoring is not uh, that important. We can use central venous line for the administration of vasopressors, but uh, for monitoring. Uh, uh, like it's not of that uh, importance. Yes, okay. we should be using an invasive arterial line for uh, each patient for B to B monitoring of the blood pressure. Very rightly said. And okay. actually, if you want to monitor in mitral, hello, hello. Yes, yes, yes sir. Yeah. Uh, if you want to mon monitor, you can mon monitor the cardiac output and the new um, monitoring to know the um, inter. Um, into arterial uh, fluid and uh, this uh, fluid levels so that if there is any load on the heart in the left atria, you can diagnose this in the early phase and you can treat. Right. Uh, Shall I... Yeah, yeah, yes, sir, please, Dr. Shaikh, sir, please. Any comments? Hello. Yes, I'm sir, not... Hello. Yes, sir, please, you are audible, sir, you can proceed. I put on this question also, role of placenta in the cardiac patients. Role of placenta, sir, I'm uh, not able to get the questions sir, actually. Uh, can I, you repeat the question? Not, not only the question, my, my this thing is, you know, as you discussed, in the severe mitral stenosis, the role of arterial pressure line and uh, central pressure line. Yes, sir. Shall I add something? Yes, sir. Sure, please. So the most important aspect in the antenatal period is placenta. The placenta is the major role in particularly in pregnant during pregnancy. It is produced five to seven times of vasodilators, particularly the pulmonary vasodilators, which is Maintaining during antenatal period, particularly this pulmonary arterial hypertension during mitral stenosis and any other cardiac patients become pregnant. The moment the placenta delivered during cesarean section or normal delivery, these hormones are metabolized within minutes. So the vasodilatation effect is vanish and then only they go into different cardiac complications so that is the reason why beat to beat monitoring is very particular in severe mitral stenosis with the help of arterial line and central venous line is it clear or yes, anybody sir. have any doubts yes, yes sir you are absolutely clear uh, you have just mentioned that 
placenta X is uh, placenta produces some pulmonary vasodilators which are protective, yes. which after delivery when the placenta is gone, those hormonal effects are lost. And that is yes. where the patients are susceptible. So, immediately after post-operative, all the anesthesiologists I am requesting act like a placenta. Which is protecting during antenatal period to a certain extent. Lacking of placenta during po post operative period. Most of the patients, they go invariable, they go into different problems, particularly severe mitral stenosis patients. The severity of the mitral stenosis depends upon the gradient across the mitral wall and pulmonary arterial hypertension. The wall area is not important. The subvalvular pathology is the criteria is going to deciding or determine the severity of the diseases, irrespective of mitral wall area. Subvalvular pathology, in addition to the gradient and pH, these three are the most important parameters deciding the severity of the and the complications during antenatal, intraoperative, during delivery or in the post-operative period. So those things to minimize with the placenta because of the secretion of the profound vasodilators, pulmonary vasodilators, lacking of the placenta in the post-operative period, most of the patients, they're going to mm -hmm. land with so many complications. So all I am requesting all the anesthesiologists, keeping these things in your mind, act like a placenta, which is uh, helping in cardiac patients, like a pulmonary vasodilator. <laughs> Hello? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Is it, is it audible? Yes, sir. Audible. Your message is absolutely clear that your message is absolutely clear, sir. Thank you, sir, for your vital inputs. Yes, this is my experience. I have seen a number of, number of mitral stenosis patients in our center. It's our medical college, teaching hospital, NRA Medical College and Hospital Vijayawada. Yes, sir. I presented this paper in the World Congress also. The role of placenta. You know. So everybody is appreciated. It's a new concept like that. Please, I'm requesting all the audience so remember this thing plus role of placenta is the vital act like a placenta which is the profound pulmonary vasodilator control the heart rate maintain the rhythm and maintain the systemic this thing lacuna of this placenta in the post operative most of the problems Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, Thank for you, such sir. a wonderful uh, and informative, info, wonderful information. Any sir, questions sir. regarding this issue? Please, I am ready to answer. No, no, like, must, answer. Answer. It yes, was a, must answer. It was a very beautiful explanation. Yes, uh, just to add to it further, because whatever you're saying is absolutely true. It acts as a protective barrier in the cardiac patients. It's a god's yes. god send of uh, what yes, yes, really. mechanisms. And definitely the hypothalamic pituitary axis, the hormonal milieu. Uh, it's a, a, it's a God gifted to the parturient. These things are definitely there. And in the few of the research paper, these things are there, but they have not been studied widely because certain issues become unethical to conduct a research on these type of things also. Otherwise, the research, if you've done on the progressive pathway on this particular Hormonal milieu, because uh, in our resource limited nation, we don't have those gadgets and, uh, you know, uh, the equipment where to, e where to measure a minute to minute level of the hormonal assays, the neurotransmitter assays, those things are very important in these type of uh, patients. Uh, definitely, this is a very good, I think, point made by you and uh, definitely helps in the uh, education of the postgraduate student also. I think Chandni and Sandeep will also agree to it that these type of things they will help in the future also. They go to the research academics later on. But you have presented elaborately this no doubt it is excellent presentation. But uh, in my experience, I'm adding this thing. The subvalvular pathology is the vital, vital uh, 
to yeah. assess the functional aspect of the That's and true. gradient across the mitral wall and PAH. So, uh, in addition to that, it's not just not the just cell valve pathology, rather the calcification, the heaviness of the leaflets, whether they will be uh, helping the gradient to at least allow the flow to move forward. So, the heaviness, the calcification, so many things are there in the valve. There is one, one more, uh, one thing, and the other one is uh, the annular fibrosis, annular uh, calcification, yeah. and the uh, cardiac tendinae. And the papillary muscle fibrosis, calcification, those things uh, are the most important. Uh, the otherwise, uh, if there is no subwall pathology, even some critical stenosis also, the dynamic movement, dynamic way of maintaining, Man, is maintained. Yes. Maintain this uh, patient, say, and maintain the uh, during and uh, in a stress situation also. They manage itself, heart. In subwall pathology, not possible. Thank you. Thank you, Mastan sir, for your vital input. This is the beauty of this online PG classes where yes, thank so you. many of the senior faculty members, they come on a single platform, they share their experiences, they share something which is there in the research but not uh, being aware to everyone. That's the beauty of these classes. Uh, uh, Madhuri ma'am, you have raised your hand. Uh, any further opinion or queries? <laughs> No, uh, my query is that regarding the sir said just now that beautiful idea of the hormones being released from the placenta. But my query is yes. that the terminal elimination half life of estrogen is 16, 16 hours. Then, yes. once the placenta is delivered, will that amount of estrogen not yet uh, still be there in the systemic circulation? Not estrogen, progesterone, madam, process cycling, and I the most important. Prostacyclin okay. and PGI. Achha. I2, I, I2, all these things are most important. These are the profound pulmonary vasodilators. Pulmonary vasodilators. Vasodilators. They secrete more compared to non pregnant female. Mm. In pregnant female, mm. because of the placenta, mm. they secrete more. Mm. As per the research, five to twenty times. Okay. That also that is the reason is part of the part of the pulmonary vascular system. Got it. If the patient delivers in the seventh month and the patient delivering in the ninth month, there is a, a huge difference in the level of the hormonals also because the placental hormone, placental hormone is a good chapter. If you go to their obstetric books, yes, yes. then you will come to know in anesthesia books, it is not written in that well yes, manner. Yes. But if you go not to the obstetric, you will get it. Yes. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, I, 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 I did more than uh, in my uh, yeah. practice, I have done more than 60, 65 cases of mitral stenosis, emergency CGN section. Emergency CGN section. More than 65 cases I have done. Dr. Yes. Madhuri. Dr. Madhuri, you take Dr. Mastan's number and get those irrespective of, irrespect of the newsletter also about these yes, type sir. of clinical things also. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's a very wonderful idea that he has uh, to Because that is a, should be published in the newsletter, at least in the initial part. Then you can... Definitely. Definitely, sir. We'll get in touch with sir. Yeah. That's ours is the tertiary center. We have aims also very close to our center. But recently started Mangalgiri in Vijayawada. It might be heard about it. Aims yes, Mangaliri. Sir, yes, everything sir. we heard about. So all the aims. Ah, yes. So that's the five kilometers away to the, the aims, our center. It's a 20 years uh, old college, our sir. And uh, the beginning, uh, I've been uh, looking at these things. And most of the emergency cases, particularly the seizure with the cardiac patient, uh, I will take care. And uh, so far, only mitals I have done more than 65 emergency CGN sections. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much for sharing your experience. Uh, may I now again invite Professor Agarwal, sir, and Dr. Mamta Sina, madam, to kindly share the key home messages for today's audience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. So basically, the key home messages are first is. Okay, so first of all, a pre-pregnancy risk assessment. That is a very vital point, which we should, uh, uh, which is the key home message. Uh, uh, 
risk assessment and risk stratification they are the two vital components which should be done in a known case of uh, mitral stenosis patient who plans to conceive or uh, uh, even in a patient who has presented during pregnancy with symptoms of mitral stenosis then we have also learned then we learned about the uh, clinical features and the pathophysiology of mitral stenosis then the next key home message is uh, when a patient presents with the symptoms of mitral stenosis we should do uh, adequate diagnostic test like an echocardiography which is very safe and we should it uh, we should be performed in any patient presenting with the uh, cardiac symptoms then uh, further uh, like risk assessment we can do with the help of different scorings as has been discussed like cartrex score and the modified who risk scoring systems then uh, further uh, uh next adequate and uh, to a team should be uh, made including an obstetrician and anesthesiologist a cardiologist who should plan for the uh, who should plan for the duration of the pregnancy and for the uh, during the delivery how the delivery process should go on then uh, depending on the type of the lesion and the functional status of the patient we should plan whether the patient should go for a vaginal delivery or a cesarean delivery then further uh, depending on the lesion we can plan whether the patient is uh, has to be planned for an elective uh, uh, cesarean or uh, uh, then the next key home message is if the patient is on anticoagulants then we need to know what anticoagulant should be given in which trimester and when to stop the anticoagulant the proper bridging therapy and then adequate management according to the anticoagulant doses so uh, these are the important key home uh, messages which i would like to deliver for the session thank you dr mamta may i now invite dr tej call sir to kindly share your experience sir we have one of the most senior anesthesiologist attending the program professor tej call sir if you can kindly unmute thank you very much thank you very much the organizers for an for giving me a chance to hear an excellent discussions of, of mitral lesions in pregnancy both the speakers did their job very well and both the moderators really helped in solving the problems and the questions raised by the audience the legacy started by dr navin malotra is carrying on under the patronage of dr bajwa and they deserve great applause and congratulations it has been very nice to hear and i wish you all the best luck and i am benefited whatever i heard i have been benefited although doing mitral stenosis and the cesarean has been a routine both in the clinical in academics as well as in the examination so everyone has done such cases and has done such cases very successfully but it has been i have been enlightened today on many points thank you very much god bless you all thank you so much sir for sharing your kind words may i now request to bajwa sir to take over the final session thank you uncle uh, call sir peri penne pehli to because uh, ashirwad of these senior teachers is always there and that's why we are here why we have progress how we have progress the way we have progressed it is because the ashirwad of all the senior teachers their guidance and similarly i think the way our students now chandni and sandeep they are appearing on this stage so definitely the guidance of dr nand kishor sir and dr mamta is definitely going to shape their future after they pass out their examination how they progress in life this pg online classes are actually meant for a, a very healthy discussion exposing our young talent to the world rather than just to the two external to internal during their final they are being exposed to the so many externals in one go and how they really answer the confidence that builds up 
it's a good for our society good for our fraternity good for our specialty that the young anesthesiologists are going to be passed passing out very soon and they will definitely do wonderful job when they take over the reins from their seniors and the presence of so many teachers here you know it's pg classes the teachers here the practitioners are also here it's not like the only the academicians here the practitioners are here the topics are such with either you in a practice or you are in an academic institution everything has to be cleared so many doubts always creep up your mind you know once you leave the medical college as a post graduate student then you don't look in the books sometimes you don't get time to look into the books but during your practice also you come across so many doubts so many th new things have developed new refreshing things have come up but we don't get time to refresh our knowledge in the conference also we don't get that much time to hear every like uh, it's become difficult it become monotonous to hear every lecture in the conferences also so these pg classes and our uh, crisp and clip series they give you ample time opportunity to discuss your doubts and uh, i am really appreciating because so many pgs attend these classes and later on on the youtube also and they watch every program and uh, i think last time also told dr madhuri went for an examination she leaked the question here on this platform which she asked in the examination and the student immediately answered that question and she was dumbfounded how was that such a difficult question was answered by the student because that student watched the online pg classes of isa <laughs> so all the answers were very much beautifully given in all the classes uh, if you go through them and moreover these programs they have developed from the last 4 years rather than i think not 4 year rather 3 years in such a manner that they are progressing so started by dr navin at that time now the things are little changing more and i think in the coming years it will change more to bring more interactive platforms so that our education become better everything is not you get into the books it's about the experience just dr mustan sir was saying it's the experience it how you really you know deal with the clinical situations the theory and the practical parts come on to a common platform those things when combined they give you a clinical perfection or whatever you acquired in your life the theoretical knowledge cannot make you genius the practical knowledge may not give you perfectness but the combination of two the combination would definitely helps in sharpening your skills and in making your a better yourself a better clinician also before going into other things i think there are uh, we still have a time to 5 uh, 6 minutes to ask suggestions from all the seniors who are or anybody else who wants to give their suggestions they can raise hands or they can unmute themselves and they can give their opinion or suggestions regarding today's class only first of all anybody yeah i want to say something sir. yes sir hello yes sir yeah, hello and uh, dr ankur yes sir you are audible sir yeah Uh, i want to say uh, this forum is a wide forum here we are having teachers we are having practitioner we are having pgs so we have to work accordingly uh, for uh, a person at remote place says it may be difficult to put atrial line or maybe difficult to put cv cvp line uh, for that uh, i want to say there are four type of anesthesia available for this patient mainly epidural secondly cac epidural plus spinal third is general anesthesia and fourth is abdominal block tap block which can be used so we have to as per the merit and demerit we have to see which anesthesia is best for the patient uh, to discuss theoretically it is very good but when you go for practical it becomes very difficult to manage the patient suppose a scenario i am saying a patient you are called in a labor room the patient during the labor gone in pulmonary edema and when you see you diagnose patient is having mid diastolic mur murmur and you see Think that the patient is having mattress pain. How to manage this patient is a very difficult, challenging thing. The patient is having pulmonary edema, tachycardia. Patient is sinking, and you have been called by gynecologist to help. This scenario comes at district places or remote medical colleges very often. These patients are not booked, so we have to work on this uh, to guide the persons who are not accredited with the academics or big center how to manage this patient. Dr. Bajwa, what do you say on this? Yeah, definitely, sir. Absolutely right. Because uh, as an anesthesiologist, we are doctors first, 
the whatever oath we have taken during our lifetime to have the patient safety first yes. we should not make it a issue that i have a lot of experience in my life lot of learning curves have been taken place so i can manage this patient we should not be very light in our decision making to take tackle such patient it concerns the life of a patient as well as in this particular case the life of a uh, a, a newborn also so here rather than just uh, depending upon on our own instincts and uh, our own what you call the instincts to get a glory to get this case done with partial knowledge is a dangerous thing if you, i ask because if i am in a practice i may not be able to you know come across so many cases in my life of mitral stenosis i will be doing the normal pregnancy cases suddenly a case comes and the case get deteriorated in the whole life you know you you can't you can't uh, you know uh, it, you will be blaming yourself you why i didn't do the proper pre anesthetic checkup where the in practice we don't get time to do the pre anesthetic checkup or optimization of such patients and these patients sometimes they may be booked with some institution living in a periphery but when they get a sudden pain or fetal distress at the night to the nearest nursing home and there the chances of mortality maternal morbidity and mortality are higher if they are taken in those centers in such cases if they have a medical record i think our anesthesiology fraternity should make a decision to transport this patient to the most safe clinical atmosphere or to the higher institution if possible unless it's a life threatening or you have a knowledge to deal with them at that particular time you undertake these cases but with a severe mitral stenosis and pregnancy it is always better to send them to a higher center where a team a team uh, because alone you cannot fight this case for a long time any complication occurs you cannot handle that and you are alone but in an institution a team is always there to handle such cases absolutely right sir it's a combination of the theoretical and practical knowledge which is very important in handling these type of cases thank you sir thank you sir Shall I comment on? Yes, sir. Please. Just uh, last month, we had one case severe mitral stenosis. Uh, hello. Yes, sir. You are audible. It is a point nine square centimeters. The pH of one ten millimeter of mercury. Point nine centimeters <coughs> square area. Of mitral wall, the gradient is twenty-three millimeter mercury at the heart rate seventy-eight, eighty-two in between. So, admitted in our hospital with the breathlessness at the thirty weeks of pregnancy, almost twenty-eight weeks. I think twenty-eight weeks of pregnancy. She had breathlessness. Admitted and we did echo and all this thing. And the gradient gradient across the mitral wall is around twenty three millimeter mercury, point nine centimeter of uh, wall area with a severe pH of one ten, and blood pressure also is more or less equal one ten by seventy millimeter mercury, and saturation uh, around ninety four ninety two like that. That was the status when she was admitted, and they referred the patient to cardiology department. the cardiology department they admitted they did echo and all these things they stabilized and then sent back to labor room for further management they have not done any interventional procedure and they have not advised anything just maintain 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 and we will observe any our need is there then we will come and Involve otherwise you maintain yourself in the lab room like that. They advise and send the patient to the lab. Room. So the patient was admitted in lab room. Somehow I don't know they referred the gynecology people, obstetricians. They referred the case to us, anesthesia department. Then along with your PGs and assistant, we went. We assessed. We advised him. We advised our obstetricians, sir. It is invariably she has to go to. Balloon mitral wall water me. Otherwise, she is going to be trouble during her antenatal period or during delivery. 
or invariably definitely she is going to problem with post operative diet like that you have written and we advise it and the same this thing again they refer to cardiology people and what they suggested patient is very stable very comfortable what is need to go for any interventional if any problem is there then we are there to take care at at this juncture not required any interventional procedure like they advise they again they send back to lab room at the 31st week of pregnancy that time i was not there i went to <clears throat> some uh, abroad and patient went into atrial fibrillation and cardiac failure and low cardiac output state then immediately patient ship to coronary care cardiac icu then they asked my help i was not there to intubate and to maintain the hemodynamics during that stage then immediately they shifted patient i advised immediately do mitral balloon mitral then only improve, otherwise impossible to save her even if you manage at this juncture but in the post operative mother is very very critical state like that we i called i i to i said to like that then immediately they do, they did balloon mitral and the open 0.9 to 1.7 cm square and after 2 3 days patient was totally improved hemodynamically very stable heart rate has come down again back 70 or uh, 69 like that it was there that time by the time i came i observed also i assisted myself and patient discharge for normal lab thank you sir he is she is at home so what i am going to explain seeing all these cases with my experience the functional status of the patient is the most important and vital during our anesthetic assessment the functional status is the most important irrespective of cardiac condition most important vital is functional status and second one is in mitral stenosis the gradient across the mitral wall and third one is the ph and the technique as somebody asked the poor physicians are there which is the ideal and better in 99% of cases except one of the patient <clears throat> they brought the patient with a shock patient admitted in shock almost no pulse no beat in that case uh, only we gave, we gave general anesthesia all cases we did under spinal only no epidural also okay. spinal what i suggested you even periphery also i am what i am going to suggest to whichever is popular familiar convenient comfort for you you go so epidural or spinal or general or whatever this thing so the most sir. important and during the procedure you maintain the diastolic period heart rate most important optimize the heart rate heart rate optimize the saturation optimize the diastolic period maintain the diastolic maximum diastolic period these are the most important most important irrespective of your drugs irrespective of your technique your irrespective of your procedure definitely i think sir has given a very good message yes. be comfortable with your techniques whatever you are best at because you are dealing with the lives of a two patients so whatever technique you are using which you are most comfortable with to save the life of such patient you do that what i observed most of the people they give a lot of <laughs> fluids iv fluids but don't don't yeah Because definitely already, those, uh, no. those things are there those are actually they have discussed yes. that also in the class yes. Yes. the definitely there are always caveats and there are limitations Some people have doubt oh, after <laughs> spinal we have to preload i have to during uh, spinal we have to maintain the load with a uh, fluid no 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 not required not required any fluids the moment you take out the bifidus and placenta the autolysis that is enough to take care of the 
your most of the patients fluid management thanks sir uh, i think ever is a time to honor our speakers today uh, no call sir you want to say something no, please just just one point just one please, point sir, please, please, please sir you see all centers in the country do not have all the facilities available definitely yes. sir the purpose of these classes is that one should know that what is the ideal method to manage a case when all facilities are available then you have to modify the management as per the your center the institution even all medical colleges do not have all facilities yes so we have to adjust but the ideal situation one must know a student must know that what is the ideal way to manage such cases that should be very clear in these classes rest of the things are as per uh, you can modify those as per the facilities available at your center even the workload it is not only the facilities even the manpower and many other factors patients financial condition many many factors many are factors. there so many you can factors. modify them that is all what i want to say yeah Thank because you. as a pg student you have to give the best ideals you have to be very ideal in the first three years when you pass out then you stick to any of the management to save the life of patient but uh, is, these are the pearls of wisdom from our great teachers and great experienced people so i now i take an opportunity to thank all our uh, presenters today so just give me one half second my screen is visible yes sir yes. visible so uh, nand kishor sir we are really blessed by your presence today thank you, you have sir. prepared your pg students very well so we are uh, felicitating you with sir the certificate uh, this is our small gesture of you know, your honor sir thank you uh, nand kishor agarwal sir so this is your certificate sir then a very dynamic dr mamta she was very much you know in the support of the pg students and she did a wonderful job in answering almost uh, 70% of the queries herself uh, dr mamta we are proud of you thank you so much sir thanks a lot and sandeep and chandni you both did a wonderful job i'm telling you you are under the able guidance of dr nand kishor sir and dr mamta and you will be doing very good in your examination the way you have handled in a very confident manner the entire nation sorry today so you both will be doing very well and our best wishes from isa to what both of you and to your rest of colleagues also who will be appearing with you thank you sir thank and you sir it was your first day today your debut debut day so you did a wonderful counseling uh, this one uh, anchoring and uh, i think you will be contributing lot to the our program thank you so much and ankur as always how many prizes you want to win <laughs> you always get so many certificates everything you get every time so thank you thank so you, much sir thank you uncle all we are always being there with us and uh, helping in the academics of our isa uh, thank you sir we should uh, ask dr mohan patak want to say something sir dr mohan patak sir you want to say something unmute yourself mohan patak sir you unmute yourself and you want to say something before we close down uh, yes. uh, i had one experience uh, with one case just want to share the case i had gone uh, the, uh, done cesarean section on patient we mean emergency i had no time to uh, go through the reports also that time patient at the end of the cesarean section she went in the pulmonary edema i immediately intubated gave her that patient oxygen and shifted the patient to the institute overnight ventilation settled her next time next day, uh, day only Uh, this way i could uh, manage the patient but uh, every time it's not possible to have uh, yes. all the investigations uh, and all uh, this is the scenario in the peripheral uh, uh, small nursing home practice sir yes uh, this may give the uh, guidance to the others uh, practitioner also. and dr nandakishor agrawal is my batch uh, mate yeah, so i just wanted you. to congratulate him are great great okay That's, yeah, yeah. Oh, he is my batch he is our hostel mate also yeah are thanks great. a lot sir and, yeah <laughs> friends okay, of thanks a lot sir Great, yeah great. thank you nice sir thank you sir yeah
Dr. Mohan Patak yes, is a regular yes, audience of our class, IAP, PG class. So, yes, sir, I have regular attendance. Yeah, also, you are always regular, sir. You always give attendance. Yes, you always ask questions yeah. also. And we are very proud Thank of you, sir. You, being, yes, you are blessing the mm -hmm. students of our country. It's uh, yeah. a blessing. And yeah, you uh, always uh, encourage the you always encourage our uh, students and your views are very much accepted means uh, considering the old uh, anesthesia practice and combination of the new thing also yeah. that we <laughs> like very much sir very much your attitude thank you, sir. thanks thank a you. lot sir thank you for the thank encouraging you. words sir we are uh, proud of you sir and uh, you, sir. finally we are coming close to uh, of this session and i'm uh, already thanked everyone but uh, i think uh, Dr. Naveen want to say something. He is pondering over the screen. I think he want to say something. Arun, I just want to simply congratulate uh, both the speakers and the moderators, Dr. Saragarwal sir and Dr. Mamta. It was excellent. I enjoyed listening to it. Thank you very much. Yeah, Thank it you. was really enjoyable. Thank you so, much. so before we close down, I request Ankur to do the formal closure so that we can close down this session today. It would be unfair to mention that Naveen sir started this ISA online PG classes. So thank you, Naveen sir, for this wonderful initiative and Dr. Bajwa sir to maintain this legacy in a very standardized manner. Thank you so much, both of you. And regarding today's presentations, I again thank Professor Agarwal sir and Dr. Mamta Sena sir, ma Madam, for sparing your valuable time, preparing your postgraduates so, so that they come out with the best of the presentations, with the best of the information so that the audience have key home messages to take back at the end of the sessions. And excellent job done by Dr. Sandeep and the second speaker. So Sandeep. thank you everyone for thank you uh, for participating in today's session. We now wind up for today's sessions, long link ISA. Uh, the, let me uh, thank Dr. Madhuri also. She is a constant force mm -hmm. behind me because you know, the ISA work is too much and she's helping me equally in the conduct of all the academy programs. So she is a silent helper in this. All she this, is uh, a very, very strong pillar, sir. Very, very she's strong. A, she's pillar. the one who is interacting with the uh, overall uh, uh, these are anchors. Coordinators. Uh, and Arpita, today she uh, interacted with them. Thank you, Dr. Madhuri, for being always there in uh, helping us in academics, in ISA academics. Uh, you can show your face, I know. You, you are there, you can show your face. and you can... Thank, you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. So, uh, time to say goodbye, good night, and uh, always end by saying, Long live ISA.